Book 8. The Shield of Aeneas. Soon as Turnus hoisted the banner of war from Laurentum's height, and the piercing trumpets blared, soon as he whipped his horses, rearing for action, clashing his spear against his shield, passions rose at once. All Latium stirred in frenzy to swear the oath, and young troops blazed for war. The chiefs in the lead, Messapus, Euphens, Mezentius, scorner of gods, called up forces from all quarters and strips of and stripped the fields of men who worked the soil. They send Venulus out to great Diomedes' city to seek reserves and announce that Trojan ranks encamp in Latium. Aeneas arrives with his armada, bringing the conquered household gods of Troy and claiming himself a king, demanded now by fate, and the many tribes report to join the Dardan chief, and his name rings far and wide through Latian country. But where does the build-up end? What does he long to gain? If luck is on his side from open warfare? Clearly, Diomedes would know better than King Turnus, better than King Latinus. So things went in Latium. Watching it all, the Trojan hero heaved in a churning sea of anguish, his thoughts racing here, there, probing his options, shifting to this plan, that, as quick as flickering light, thrown off by water and bronze bowl reflects the sun, or radiant moon, now flittering near and far, now rising to strike a ceiling's gilded fretwork. The dead of night, over the earth, all weary living things, all birds and flocks, were fast asleep when Captain Aeneas, his heart racked by the threat of war, lay down on a bank beneath the chilly arc of the sky, and at long last indulged his limbs in sleep. Before his eyes, the god of the lovely river, old Tiber himself, seemed to rise from among the poplar leaves, with a shady crown of reeds, reeds, reeds to wreathe his hair, and greeted Aeneas to ease him of his anguish. Born of the stock of gods, you who bring back Troy to us from enemy hands and save her heights forever, how long we waited for you here on Laurentine soil and Latian fields. Here your home is assured, yes, assured for your household gods. Don't retreat. Don't fear the threats of war. The swelling rage of the gods has died away. I tell you now, so you won't think me an empty dream, that under an oak along the banks you'll find a great sow stretched on her side with thirty pigs just farrowed, a snow-white mother with snow-white young at her dugs. By this sign, after thirty years have made their rounds, Ascanius will establish Alba, bright as the city's name. All that I foresee has been decreed. But how to begin this current struggle here and see it through? Victorious all the way? I'll explain in a word or so. Listen closely. On these shores, Arcadians sprung from Pallas. King Evander's comrades, marching under his banner, picked their site and placed a city on these hills. Pelentium, named for their famous forebear, Pallas. They wage a relentless war against the Latin people. Welcome them to your camp as allies. Seal your packs. I myself will lead you between my banks, upstream, making your way against the current under oars. I'll speed you on your journey. Up with you, son of Venus. Now, as the first stars set, offer the proper prayers to Juno. Overcome her anger and threats with vows and plead for help. You will pay me with honors once you have won your way. I am the flowing river that you see, sweeping the banks and cutting across the tilled fields, rich and green. I am the river Tiber, clear blue as the heavens, stream most loved by the gods who rule the sky. My great home is here. My fountain gives rise to noble cities. With that, the river sank low in his deep pool, heading down to the depths as Aeneas, night and slumber over, gazing towards the sunlight climbing up the sky, rises, duly draws up water in cupped hands, and pours forth his prayers to heaven he heaven's heights. You nymphs, Laurentine nymphs, you spring of rivers, and you, Father Tiber, you and your holy stream, embrace Aeneas, shield him from dangers now at last. You who pity our hardships, wherever the ground lies, where you come surging forth in all your glory, always with offerings, always with gifts, I'll do you honor. You great horned king of the rivers of the west, 
just be with me. Prove your will with works. So he prays, and choosing a pair of galleys from the fleet, he mans them both with rowers, while fitting out his troops with battle gear. But look, suddenly, right up before his awestruck eyes, a marvel, shining white through the woods with the brood as white, lying stretched out on a grassy bank for all to see, a great sow. Devout Aeneas offers her up to you, Queen Juno on high, a blood sacrifice to you, standing her at your altar with her young. And all night long the Tiber lulled his swell, checking his current so his waves would lie serene, silent still as a clear lagoon or peaceful marsh, soothing its surface smooth, no labor there for oars. So they embark with cheers to speed them on their way, and the dark tarred hulls go gliding through the river, amazing the tides, amazing the groves, unused to the sight of warrior shields, flashing far in blazoned galleys moving on upstream. And on and on they row, wearying night and day as they round the long, winding bins, floating under the mottled shade of many trees, and cleave the quiet stream reflecting leafy woods. The fiery sun had climbed to mid-career when, off in the distance, they catch sight of walls, a citadel, scattered roofs of houses, all that now the imperial power of Rome has lifted to the skies, but then what Evanders held, his humble kingdom. Quickly they swerve their prows and row for town. As luck would have it, that day Arcadia's king was holding solemn annual rites in honor of Hercules, Amphitryon's powerful son, and paying vows to the gods in a grove before the city. Flanked by his son, Pallas, the ranking men, and the lowly senate, all were offering incense now, and warm blood was streaming on the altars. As soon as they saw the tall ships gliding through the shadowed woods, and the rowers bending to pull the oars in silence, alarmed by the unexpected sight, all rise as one to desert the sacred feast. But Pallas forbids them, to cut short the rites, and fearless, seizes a spear and runs to confront the new arrivals by himself. Soldiers, he shouts from a barrow some way off, what drives you to try these unfamiliar paths? Where are you going? Who are your people? Where is your home? Do you bring peace or war? Then Captain Aeneas calls from his high stern, his hands extending the olive branch of peace. We're Trojans born, the weapons you see are honed for our foes, the Latins. They drive us here as exiles with all the arrogance of war. We look for Evander to tell him this. Leading chiefs of Dardania come, pressing to be his friends in arms. Dardania, Pallas, awestruck by this famous name, cries out, Come down onto dry land, whoever you are. Speak with my father face to face. Come under our roofs, our welcome guest. Clasping Aeneas' right hand, he held it long, and heading up to, the, up to the grove, they leave the river. There Aeneas hails Evander with winning words. Best of the sons of Greece, fortune has decreed that I pray to you for help. Extend this branch of olive wound in wool. I had no fear of you as a captain of the Greeks, Arcadia born and bound by blood to Atreus' twin sons. For I am bound to you by my own strength, by oracles of the gods and by our fathers, blood kin, and your own fame that echoes through the world. All this binds me to you, and fate drives me here, and glad I am to follow. Dardanus, first and founding father of Ilium, came to the land of Troy. A son, as Greeks will tell, of Electra, that Electra, daughter of Atlas, mighty Atlas, who bears the grand orb of the heavens on his shoulders. Your father is Mercury, conceived by radiant Maya and born on a snow-capped peak of Mount Silene. But Maya's trust, to, or Maya's father, to trust what we have heard, is Atlas, the same Atlas who lifts the starry skies. So our two lines are branches, sprung from the same blood. Counting on this, I planned my approach to you. Not with envoys or artful diplomatic probes. I come in person, put my life on the line, a suppliant at your doors to plead for help. The same people attack us both in savage war, Rutulians under Turnus, and if they drive us out, nothing they do believe 
can stop their force all of Italy, all lands of the west beneath their yoke, the masters of every seaboard, north and south. Take and return our trust, brave hearts in war, our tempers steeled, our armies proved in action. Aeneas closed. While he spoke, Evander had marked his eyes, his features, his whole frame, and now he replies pointedly, Bravest of Trojans, how I welcome you, recognize you with all my heart. How well I recall the face, the words, the voice of your father, King Anchises. Once, I remember, Priam, son of Laomedon, bound for Salamis, out to visit his sister Hesione's kingdom, continued on to see Arcadia's cold frontiers. Then my cheeks still sported the bloom of youth, and I was full of wonder to see the chiefs of Troy, wonder to see Laomedon's son, Priam himself, no doubt, but one walked taller than all the rest, Anchises. I yearned, in a boy's way, to approach the king and take him by the hand. So up I went to him, eagerly showed him round the walls of Phine Phineas. At his departure, he gave me a splendid quiver, bristling Lycian arrows, a battle cape shot through with golden mesh, and a pair of gilded reins, my son. Pallas now makes his. So the right hand you want is clasping yours. We are allies bound as one. Soon as tomorrow's sun returns to light the earth, I'll see you off, cheered with an escort, and support I'll send your way. But now for the rites, since you have come as friends, our annual rites it would be wrong to interrupt. So, with a warm heart, celebrate them with us now. High time you felt at ease with comrades fair. That said, he orders back the food and cups already cleared away and the king himself conducts his guests to places on the grass. Aeneas, the guest of honor, he invites to a throne of maple, cushioned soft with his shaggy lion's hide. Then picked young men and the altar priest, outdoing themselves, bring on the roasted flesh of bulls and heap the baskets high with the gifts of Ceres, wheaten loaves just baked, and in Bacchus's name they keep the wine cups flowing. And now Aeneas and all his Trojan soldiers feast, on the oxen's long back cut and sacred vitals. Once their ha hunger was put aside, their appetites content, King Evander began. These annual rites, this feast, a custom ages old, this shrine to a great spirit, no hollow superstition, and no blind ignorance of the early gods has forced them on us. No, my Trojan guest, we have been saved from dangers, brutal perils, and so we observe these rites. We renew them year by year, and justly so. Now then, first look up at this crag with its overhanging rocks, the boulders strewn afar. An abandoned mountain lair still stands, where the massive rocks came rumbling down in an avalanche, a rune. There once was a cavern here, a vast unplumbed recess, untouched by the sun's rays, where a hideous, part human monster, made his home. Cacus. The ground was always steaming with fresh blood and nailed to his high and mighty doors. Men's faces dangled, sickening, rotting, and blood white. The monster's father was Vulcan, whose smoky flames he vomited from his maw as he hauled his lumbering hulk. But even to us, at last, time brought the answer to our prayers, the help, the arrival of a god, that greatest avenger, Hercules. On he came, triumphant in his slaughter, and all the spoils of a triple-bodied Geryon. The great victor, driving those huge bulls down to a pasture, herds crowding these river banks and glens. But Cacus, desperate bandit, wild to leave, no crime, no treachery undared, untested, stole from their steadings, four champions bulls, and as many heads of first-rate, well-built heifers. Ah, but to leave no hoof marks pointing forward, into his cave he dragged them by the tail, turning their tracks backward. The pirate hid his plunder deep in his dark rocks. No hunter could spot a trace that led toward that cave. Meanwhile, 
Hercules was about to move his herds out, full fed from their grazing, ready to go himself when the cows began to low at parting, filling the woods with protest, bellowing to the hills they had to leave. But one heifer, deep in the vast cavern, lowed back, and Cacus's prisoner foiled its jailer's hopes. Suddenly, Hercules ignited in rage, in black furry, fury, and seizing his weapons and weighted knotted club, he made for the hill's steep heights at top speed. And that was the first we'd seen of Cacus afraid, his eyes a swirl with terror. Off to his cave he flees, swifter than any east wind. Yes, his feet were winged with fear. He shut himself in its depths, shattered the chains, and down the great rock dropped, suspended by steel and his father's skill, to wedge between the doorposts, block the entrance fast. Watch Hercules on the attack, scanning every opening, tossing his head, this way, that way, grinding his teeth, blazing in rage. Three times he circles the whole Aventine hill. Three times he tries to storm the rocky gates. No use. Three times he sinks down in the lowlands, power spent. Looming over the cavern's ridge, a spur reared up, all jagged flint, its steep sides shearing away, a beetling, towering sight, a favorite haunt of nestling vultures. This crag jutting over the ridge, leaning left of the river down below, he charged from the right and rocked it, prized it, prized it up from its bedrock, tore it free of its roots, then abruptly hurled it down, and the hurl's force made mighty heaven roar as the banks split far apart and the river's tide went flooding back in terror. But the cave and giant palace of Cacus lay exposed, and his shadowy cavern cleaved wide to its depths, as if earth's steps had yawned under some upheaval, bursting open the locks of the underworld's abodes, revealing the livid kingdom loathed by the gods, and from high above you could see the plunging abyss and the ghosts terror-struck as the light comes streaming in. So Cacus, caught in that stunning flood of light, shut off in his hollow rock, howling as never before, Hercules overwhelms him from high above, raining down all weapons he finds at hand, torn off branches, rocks like millstones. A death trap, no way out for the monster now. Cacus retches up from his throat, dense fumes, unearthly, I tell you, endless waves billowing through his lair, wiping all from sight, and deep into his cave he spews out tides of rolling, smoking darkness, night and fire fused. Undaunted Hercules had enough. Furious, headlong down, he leapt through the flames where the thickest smoke was massing, black clouds of it seething up and down the enormous cavern. Here, as Cacus spouts his flames in the darkness, all for nothing, Hercules grapples him, knots him fast in a death lock, throttling him, gouging out the eyes in his head, choking the blood in his gullet dry. He tears out the doors in a flash, opens the pitch-black den and the stolen herds, a crime that Cacus had denied, are laid bare to the skies, and out by the heels he drags the ghastly ca carcass into the light. No one can get his fill of, glazing at those eye of gazing at those eyes, terrible eyes, that face, the matted, bristling chest of the brute beast, its fiery maw burnt out. From then on, we have solemnized this, solemnized this service, and all our heirs have kept the day with joy. Potitius I, the founder of the rites, the Pinarian house too, that guards the worship of Hercules. Potitius set this altar in the grove, the greatest altar we shall always call it, always the greatest it will be. So come, my boys, in honor of his heroic exploits, crown your hair with leaves, hold high your cups, invoke the god we share with our new allies, Offer him wine with all your eager hearts. With that welcome, a wreath of poplar, hung with the poplar's garlands green and silver sheen that shaded Hercules once, shaded Evander's hair and crowned his head and the sacred wooden wine cup filled his hand. In no time, all were tipping wine on the board with happy hearts and praying to the gods. Meanwhile, evening is coming closer, wheeling down the sky, and now the priests advance, Potitius in the lead, 
robed in animal skins the old accustomed way, and bearing torches. They refreshed the banquet, bringing on the second course, a welcome savor, weighing the altars down with groaning platters. Then the Sally, dancing priests of Mars, come, clustering, leaping round the flaming, flaming altars, raising the chorus, brows wreathed with popular, poplar. Here a troop of boys and a troop of old men there, singing Hercules' praises, all his heroic feats. How he strangled the first monsters, twin serpents, sent by his stepmother Juno, crushed them in his hands. And the same in warfare, how he raised to the roots those brilliant cities, Troy and Ochelia both. How under Eurystheus, Eurystheus he had endured the countless grueling labors, Juno's brutal doom. Hercules, you the unvanquished one, you have slaughtered centaurs born of the clouds, half man, half horse, Halius and Pholus, the bull, the monster of Crete, the tremendous Nemean lion hold in his rocky den, the Stygian tide pools trembled at your arrival, death's watchdog cringed, sprawling over the heaps of half-devoured bones in his gory cave, but nothing, no specter on earth has touched your heart with fear, not even Typhus himself, towering up with weapons, nor did Lerna's hydra, heads swarming around you, strip you of your wits. Hail, true son of Jove, you glory added to all the gods. Come to us, come to your sacred rites, and speed us on with your own righteous stride. So they sing his praise, and to crown it, sing of Cacus's cave, the monster breathing fire, and all the woods resound with the ringing hymns, and the hillsides echo back. And then, with the holy rites performed in full, they turned back to the city. The king, bent with years, kept his comrades, Aeneas and his son, beside him, moving on as he eased the way with many stories. Aeneas marveled, his keen eyes gazing round, entranced by the sight, gladly asking, learning, one by one, the legendary tales of the men of old. King Evander, founder of Rome's great citadel, begins. These woods the native fawns and nymphs once held, and a breed of mortals sprung from the rugged trunks of oaks. They had no notion of custom, no cultured way of life, knew nothing of the yoking oxen, laying away provisions, garnering up their stores. They lived off branches, berries and acorns, hunters rough-cut fare. First came Saturn, down from the heights of heaven, fleeing Jove in arms. Saturn, robbed of his kingdom, exiled. He united these wild people scattered over the hilltops, gave them laws, and pitched on the name of Latium for the land, since he'd lain hidden within its limits, safe and sound. Saturn rain, Saturn's reign was the age of gold, men like to say. So peacefully, calm and kind, he ruled his subjects. Aha, but little by little a lesser, tarnished age came stealing in, filled with the madness of war, the passion for possessions. Then on they came, the Osonian ranks in arms, Sicanian tribes, and time and again the land of Saturn changed its name. Then kings reared up, and the savage giant Thybris, and since his time, we, call, we Italians call our river Tiber. The true name of the old river Albula is lost and gone. And I, cast from my country, bound for the ocean's end, irresistible fortune and inescapable fate have planted me in this place. Spurred on by my mother's dire warnings, the nymph Carmentus and the god Apollo's power. No sooner said than, moving on, he points out the altar of Carmentus, then the Carmental Gate, as the Romans call it, an ancient tribute paid to the nymph Carmentus, seer who told the truth, the first to foresee the greatness of Aeneas' sons and Palentium's fame to come. Next he displays the grand grove that heroic Romulus restored as a refuge, the Asylum, then shows him, under its chilly rock, the grotto called the Lupercal, in the old Arcadian way, Pan of Mount Lysaeus. And he shows him the grove of hallowed Argilad Argiletum too. He swears by the spot, retells the death of Argus, once his guest. From there, he leads Aeneas on to Tarpeia's house, 
and the capital, all gold now, but once in the old days, thorny, dense with thickets. Even then, the awesome dread of the place struck fear in the hearts of the rustics. Even then, they trembled before the woodland and the rock. This is Grove, he says. This hill with its crown of leaves is a god's home, whatever god he is. My Arcadians think they've seen Almighty Jove in person, often brandishing high his black storm shield in his right, strong right hand as he drives the tempest on. Here, what's more, in these two towns, their walls raised to the roots, you can see the relics, monuments of the men of old. This fortress built by Father Janus, that by Saturn, this was called the Janiculum, that Saturnia. So, conversing and drawing near Evander's humble home, they saw herds of cattle everywhere, lowing loudly in the Roman Forum in Carinae's elegant district. These gates, Evander says as he reaches his lodge, Hercules in his triumph stooped to enter here. This mansion of mine was grand enough for him. Courage, my friend. Dare to scoff at riches? Make yourself, you too, worthy to be a god. Come into my meager house, and don't be harsh. So he said, and under his narrow sloped roof, he led the great Aeneas, laid him down on a bed of fallen leaves and the hide of a Libyan, Libyan bear. Night comes rushing down, embracing the earth in its deep, dark wings. But his mother, Venus, stirred by fear, no wonder, by all the threats and the Latin's violent uproar, goes to Vulcan now, and there in their golden bridal chamber whispers, breathing immortal love through every word. When Greek kings were ravishing Troy in war, her faded towers, her ramparts doomed to enemy fires, I asked no help for the victims then. I never begged for the weapons right within your skill and power. No, my dearest husband, I'd never put you to work in a lost cause, much as I owed to Priam's sons. However often I wept for Aeneas's grueling labors. Now, by Jove's command, he lands on Rutulian soil. So now I do come, kneeling before the godhead I adore, begging weapons for my Aeneas, a mother for her son. Remember Aurora, Tithonus's wife, and Nereus's daughter? Both wept, and you gave way. Look at the armies massing, cities bolting their gates, honing swords against me to cut my loved ones down. No more words. The goddess threw her snow-white arms around him as he held back, caressing him here and there, and suddenly he caught fire. The same old story, the flame he knew by heart went running through him, melting him to the marrow of his bones. As thunder at times will split the sky and a trail of fire goes rippling through the clouds, flashing, blinding light. And his wife sensed it all, delighting in her bewitching ways. She knew her beauty's power. And Father Vulcan, enthralled by Venus, his everlasting love, replied, Why plumb the past for appeals? Where has it gone, goddess, the trust you lodged in me? If only you'd been so passionate for him, then as now, we'd have been within our rights to arm the Trojans even then. Neither Father Almighty nor the fates were dead against Troy's standing any longer, or Priam's living on for ten more years. But now, if you are gearing up for war, your mind set, whatever my pains and all my skill can promise, whatever molten electrum and iron can bring to life, whatever the bellows' fiery blast can do, enough. Don't pray to me now. Never doubt your powers. With those words on his lips, he gave his, wipes, his wife the embraces both desired. Then sinking limp on her breast, he courted peaceful sleep that stole throughout his body. And then, when the first deep rest had, had driven sleep away, and the chariot of night had wheeled past mid-career, that hour a housewife rises, faced with scratching out a living with loom and Minerva's homespun crafts, and rakes the ashes first to awake the sleeping fires adding night to her working hours, and sets her women toiling on at the long day's chores by torchlight, and to all to keep the bed of her husband chaste, and rear her little boys. So early, briskly, in such good time, the fire god rises up from his downy bed to labor at his forge. Not far from Aeolian Lepere, flanked by Sicily's coast, 
An island of smoking boulders surges from the sea. Deep below it is a vast cavern thunders, hollowed out like vaults under Etna, forming the Cyclops' forges. You can hear the groaning anvils boom with mighty strokes, the hot steel ingots screeching steam in the cavern's troughs, and the fires panting hard in the furnace. Vulcan's home. It bears the name Vulcania. Here the fire god dove from heaven's heights. The Cyclops were forging iron now in the huge cave. Thunder and lightning and fire anvils stripped bare. They had in hand a bolt they had just hammered out. One of the countless bolts the father rains on earth from the arching sky. Part buffed already, part still rough. Three shafts of jagged hail they'd riveted on that weapon. Three of bursting storm clouds. Three of blood-red flame and the south wind winging fast. They welded into the work the blood-curdling flashes, crackling thunder, terror, and rage in hot pursuit. Others were pressing on, forging a chariot's whirling wheels for Mars to harrow men and panic towns in war. Others were finishing off the dreaded Aegis, donned by Pallas Athena, blazing up in arms, outdoing themselves with burnished gilded scales, with serpents coiling, writhing around each other, the gorgon herself, the severed heads, the rolling eyes, the breastplate forced to guard the goddess's chest. Pack it away, he shouts. Whatever you've started, set it aside, my cyclops of Etna. Bend to this. Armor must be forged for a man of courage. Now for strength, you need it. Now for flying hands. Now for mastery. All your skill. Cast the delay to the winds. Enough said. At a stroke, they all pitched into the work, dividing the labors, share and share alike. And bronze is running in rivers, and flesh tearing steel and gold ore, melting down in the giant furnace. They are forging one tremendous shield, one against all the Latin spears, welding seven plates, circular rim to rim. And some are working the bellows, sucking the air in, blasting it out, while others are plunging hissing bronze in the brimming troughs, the ground of the cavern groaning under the anvil's weight. And the cyclops raising their arms with all their power, arms up, arms down to the drumming, pounding beat, as they twist the molten mass in gripping tongs. While Vulcan, the lord, the lord of Limnos, spurs the work below that Aeolian coast, the life-giving light and birdsong under the eaves at crack of dawn awake Evander from sleep in his humble lodge. The old man rises, pulls a tunic over his chest, and binds his Etruscan sandals round his feet. Over his right shoulder, down his flank, he straps an Arcadian sword, swirling back the skin of a panther to drape his left side. For company, two watchdogs go loping on before him over the high door sill friends to their master's steps. He makes his way to the private quarters of his guest, Aeneas, the old veteran bearing in mind their recent talk and the help that he had promised. Just as early, Aeneas is stirring too. One comes with his son, Pallas. The other brings Achates. They meet and grasp bright hands, and sitting there in the open court are free at last to indulge in frank discussion. The old king starts in, Greatest chief of the Trojans, for while you are alive, I'll never consider Troy and its kingdom conquered. Our power to reinforce you in war is slight, though I know our name is great. Here the Tiber cuts us off, and there the Rutulians close the vice. The clang of their armor echoes round our walls. But I mean to ally you now with mighty armies, vast encampments filled with royal forces. Your way to safety revealed by unexpected luck. It's fate that you called that that called you on to reach our shores. Now, not far from here, a Gila city stands, founded on age old rock by Lydian people once, brilliant in war, who built on Etruscan hilltops. The city flowered for many years, till King Mezentius came to power, his brutal rule, barbaric force of arms. Why recount his unspeakable murders? savage crimes, the tyrant. God store up such pains for his own head and all his sons. Why, 
He'd even bind together dead bodies and living men, couple them tightly, hand to hand and mouth to mouth. What torture! So that so in that poison, oozing putrid slime, they'd die by inches, locked in their brute embrace. Then at last, at the end of their rope, his people revolt against that raving madman. They besiege Mezentius and in his palace, hack his henchmen down, and fling fire on his roof. In all this slaughter, he slips away, taking flight to Rutulian soil, shielded by Turnus' armies, his old friend. So all Etruria rises up in righteous fury, demanding the king, threatening swift attack. Thousands, Aeneas, and I will put you in command. Their fleet is massed on the shore, and a low roar grows, men crying for battle standards now. But an aged prophet holds them back, singing out his song of destiny. You elite Lydian troops, fine flower of courage, born of an ancient race. Oh, what just resentment whips you into battle. Mezentius makes you burn with well-earned rage. But still the gods forbid an Italian commander to lead a race so great. Choose leaders from overseas. At that, the Etruscan fighting ranks subsided. Checked on a fe- on the field of battle, struck with awe by the warnings of the gods. Tarkon himself has sent me envoys, bearing the crown and scepter, offering me the ins- uh, ensigns, urging, Join our camp! Take the Etruscan throne. Ah, but old age, sluggish cold played out with the years, has me in its grip, denies me the command. My strength is too far gone for feats of arms. I'd urge my son to accept, but his blood is mixed, half sab- saving thanks to his mother, and so Italian. You are the one whose age and breed the fates approve, the one the powers call. March out on your mission, bravest chief of the Trojans, now the Italians too. What's more, I will pair you with Pallas, my hope, my comfort. Under your head, let him, under your lead, let him grow hard to a soldier's life and the rough work of war. Let him get used to watching you in action, admire you as his model from his youth. To him, I will give two hundred horsemen now. Fighting hearts of oaks, of oak, are best and Pallas will give you two hundred more, in Pallas's name. He had barely closed, and Anchises' son, Aeneas, and trusty Achates, a- their eyes fixed on the ground, would long have worried deep in their anxious hearts, if Venus had not given a sign from the cloudless sky. A bolt of lightning suddenly split the heavens, drumming thunder. The world seems to fall in a flash, the blare of Etruscan t- trumpets blasting through the sky. They look up, the terrific peals coming, come crashing over and over, and see blood red in a brilliant sky, rifting a cloud bank, armor clashing out. All the troops were drumstruck, all but the Trojan hero. Well, he knew that sound, his goddess mother's promise, and he calls out, Don't ask, my friend, don't ask me, I beg you, what these portents bring. The heavens call for me. My goddess mother promised to send this sign if war were breaking out, and bring me armor down through the air, forged by Vulcan himself to speed me on in battle. But, oh, dear gods, what slaughter threatens the poor Laurentine people? What a price in bloodshed, Turnus, you will pay me soon. For many shields and helmets and corpses of the brave you'll churn beneath your tides, old father Tiber. All right then, you Rutulians, beg for war. Break your packs of peace. Fighting words. Aeneas rises from his high seat, and first he rakes the fires asleep on Hercules' altar, then gladly goes to the lowly gods of hearth and home he worshipped just the day before. Evander himself and his new Trojan allies share and share alike, slaughter yearling sheep as the old rite demands. And next Aeneas returns to his ships and shipmates, picks the best and bravest to take his lead in war, while the rest glide on at ease. No oar is required, as the river's current bears them on downstream to bring Ascanius news of his father and his affairs. Horses go to the Trojans, bound for Tuscan fields, and marked for Aeneas. 
a special mount decked out in a tawny lion's skin that gleams with gilded claws. A sudden rumor flies through the little town. Horsemen are rushing toward the Tuscan monarch's gates. Mothers, struck with terror, pray and re-echo prayers. The fear builds as the deadly peril comes closer. The specter of war looms larger, ever larger. Evander, seizing the hand of his departing son, clinging, weeping inconsolably, cries out, If only Jove would give me back the years, all gone, and make me the man I was, killing the front ranks just below Pranestes' ramparts, heaping up their shields, torching them in my triumph. My right hand sent great Arulius, Arulus down to hell. Three lives his mother, Feronia, gave him at his birth. I shudder to say it now. Three suits of armor for action. Three times I had to lay him low, but my right hand, my right hand then, stripped him of all his lives and all his armor too. Oh, if only, then nor f no force could ever tear me now from your dear embrace, my boy. Nor could Mezentius ever have trod his neighbor Evander down, butchered so many, bereaved our city, so many widows left. But you, you powers above, and you, Jupiter, highest lord of the gods, pity, I implore you, a king of Arcadia, hear a father's prayers. If your commands will keep my palace safe, and if the fates intend to preserve my son, and if I live to see him, join him, join him again, why then I pray for life. I can suffer any pain on earth. But if you are threatening some disaster fortune, let me break this brutal life off now, now while anxieties waver and hopes for the future fade. While you, my beloved boy, my lone delight, come lately, I still hold you in my embrace. Oh, let no graver news arrive and pierce my ears. So, at their last parting, the words came pouring deep from Evander's heart. He collapsed, and his servants bore him quickly into the house. And even now the cavalry had come riding forth through the open gates, Aeneas out in the lead, flanked by trusty Achates, then the other Trojan captains, with Pallas in command of the column's center. Pallas, brilliant in battle cape, and glittering inlaid armor. Bright as the morning star whom Venus loves above all the burning stars on high, when up from his ocean bath he lifts his holy face to the lofty skies and dissolves away the darkness. Mothers stand on the ramparts, trembling, eyes trailing the cloud of dust and the troops in gleaming bronze. Over the brush, the quickest route, cross-country, armored fighters ride. Cries go up, squadrons form, Galloping hoofbeats drum the rutted plain with thunder. Next to Cherry's icy river, a huge grove stand, stands, held in ancestral awe by people far and wide. On all sides cupped around by sheltering hills and ringed by pitch-dark pines, the story goes that ancient Pelasgians, first in time long past to settle the Latian borders, solemnized the grove and a festal day to Sylvanus, god of fields and flocks. Not far from here, Tarkon and his Etruscans mustered, all secure, and now from the hills his entire army could be seen encamped on the spreading plain. Down come Captain Aeneas and all his fighters, picked for battle, water their horses well, and weary troops take west. But the goddess Venus, lustrous among the cloud banks, bearing her gifts, approached, and when she spotted her son alone, off in a glade's recess by the frigid stream, she hailed him, suddenly there before him. Look, just forged to perfection by all my husband's skill, the gifts I promised. There is no need now, my son, to flinch from fighting swaggering la Latin ranks or challenging savage Turnus to a duel. With that, Venus reached to embrace her son, and set the brilliant armor down before him under a nearby oak. Aeneas takes delight in the goddess's gifts and the honor of it all as he runs his eyes across them piece by piece. He cannot get enough of them, filled with wonder, turning them over, now with his hands, now his arms, the terrible crested helmet plumed in shooting fire, the sword blade honed to kill, the breastplate, solid bronze, 
blood red and immense, like a dark blue cloud inflamed by the sun's rays and gleaming through the heavens. Then the burnished greaves of Electrum, smelted gold, the spear and shield, the workmanship of the shield, no words can tell its power. There is the story of Italy, Rome in all her triumphs. There the fire god forged them, well aware of the seers and schooled in times to come. All in order, the generations born of Ascanius's stock and all the wars they raged. Waged. <laughs> and Vulcan forged them too. The mother wolf stretched out in the green grotto of Mars, twin boys at her dugs, who hung there, frisky, suckling without a fear, as she with her lithe neck bent back, stroking each in turn, licked her wolf pups into shape with a mother's tongue. Not far from there, he had forged Rome as well, and Sabine women, brutally dragged from the crowded bull when the circus games were played, and the abruptly war broke out afresh, the sons of Romulus battling old King Taddeus's hardened troops from Curies. <clears throat> then when the same chiefs had set aside their strife, they stood in full armor before Jove's holy altar, lifting cups and slaughtered a sow to bind their packs. Nearby, Two four-horse chariots, driven to left and right, had torn Metis apart, man of Elba. You should have kept your word. And Tullus hauled the lyre's viscera through the brush, as blood drops dripped like dew from breaks of thorns. Porcena there commanded Romans to welcome banished Tarquin back, mounted a massive siege to choke the city, Aeneas' heirs rushing headlong against the steel in freedom's name. See Porcina to the life, his likeness menacing, raging, and why? Socles dared to rip the bridge down. Clo Clolia burst her chains and swam the flood. Crowning the shield, guarding the fort atop the Tarpeian rock, Manlius stood before the temple, held the capital's heights. The new thatched bristled thick on Romulus's palace roof, and here the silver goose went ruffling through the gold arcades, squawking its warning. Gauls attack the gates, Gauls swarming the thickets, about to seize the fortress, shielded by shadows, gift of the pitch-dark night. Gold their flowing hair, their war dress gold, striped capes glinting, their milky necks ringed with golden chokers, pairs of alpine pikes in their hands, flashing like fire, and long shields wrap their bodies. Here, Vulcan pounded out the Sali, dancing priests of Mars, the Luperci, stripped Luperci, stripped their peaked caps wound with wool, bearing their body shields that dropped from heaven, and chaste matrons, riding in pillowed coaches, led the sacred marches through the city. Far apart on the shield, what's more, he forged the homes of hell, the high gates of death, and the torments of the doomed. With you, Catiline, dangling from a beetling crag, cringing before the Furies' open mouths, and set apart the virtuous souls with Cato giving laws. And amidst it all, the heaving sea ran far and wide, its likeness forged in gold, but the deep blue foamed in a sheen of white, and rounding it out in a huge ring swam the dolphins, brilliant in silver, tails sweeping the crest to cut the waves in two. And here... In the heart of the shield, the bronze ships, the Battle of Actium. You could see it all, the world drawn up for war. Lucata headline, seething, the breakers molten gold. <clears throat> On one flank, Caesar Augustus leading Italy into battle. The Senate and people too, the gods of hearth and home and the great gods themselves. High astern he stands, the twin flames shoot forth from his lustrous brows and rising from the peak of his head, his father's star. On the other flank, Agrippa stands tall as he steers his ships in line, impelled by favoring winds and gods, and from his forehead glitter the beaks of ships on the naval crown, proud ensign earned in war. And opposing them comes Antony, leading on the riches of the Orient, troops of every stripe, victor over the nations of the dawn and blood-red shores in his retinue, in his retinue, Egypt, all the might of the east and Bactra, the end of the earth, 
and trailing in his wake that outrage, that Egyptian wife. All launch in as one, whipping the whole sea to foam with tugging, thrashing oars and cleaving triple beaks as they make a run for open sea. You'd think the Cyclades, ripped up by the roots, afloat on the swells, or mountains ramming against mountains, so immense the turrets astern as sailors attack them, showering flaming tow and hot bolts of flying steel, and the fresh blood running red on Neptune's fields. And there in the thick of it all, the queen is mustering her armada, clacking her native rattles, still not glimpsing the twin vipers hovering at her back, as Anubis barks and the queen's chaos of monster gods train their spears on Neptune, Venus, and great Minerva. And there, in the heart of battle, Mars rampages on, cast in iron, with grim furies plunging down the sky, and strife and triumph rushing in with her slashed robes, and Bologna cracking her bloody lash in hot pursuit. And scanning the melee, high on Actium's heights, Apollo bent his bow, and terror struck them all. Egypt and India, all the Arabians, all the Sabians, wheeled in their tracks and fled. And the queen herself, you could see her calling, tempting the winds, her sails spreading, and now, now about to let her sheets run free. Here in all this carnage, the god of fire forged her pale with imminent death, sped on by the tides and northwest wind. And rising up before her, the Nile immersed in mourning opens every fold of his mighty body, all his rippling robes, inviting into his deep blue lap in secret eddies all his conquered people. But Caesar, in triple triumph, borne home through the walls of Rome, was paying eternal vows of thanks to the gods of Italy, three hundred imposing shrines throughout the city. The roads resounded with joy, revelry, clapping hands, with bands of matrons in every temple, altars in each, and the ground before them strewn with slaughtered steers. Caesar himself, throned at brilliant Apollo's snow-white gates, reviews the gift brought on by the nations of the earth, and he mounts them high on the lofty temple doors, as the vanquished people move in a long, slow file. Their dress, their arms as motley as their tongues. Here Vulcan had forged the nomad race, the Africans with their trailing robes, here the Lelegis, Carians, Gelonian archers bearing quivers, Euphrates flowing now with a humbler tide, the Marini brought from the world's end, the two-horned Rhine and the Dahe never conquered, Araxes River bridling at its bridge. Such vistas the god of fire forged across the shield that Venus gives her son. He fills with wonder. He knows nothing of these events, but takes delight in their likeness lifting onto his shoulders now the fame and fates of all his children's children. That is the end of book eight.